Well, I'm uh, John. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here if you're visiting. And um, once again, a big, warm, happy Mother's Day to each one of you. I know it's a mixed day for many. Lots of different emotions, but for those mothers or mother figures that are in our congregation, we pray that you have a blessed day today. Brilliant. Well, we've uh, almost reached the end of our current series that's been on the Ten Commandments. We've been reflecting on a different commandment each week, and Debbie has done a great job. Debbie, give us a wave. There she is. So if you have a look around, and... uh, just a reminder of each of the te- uh, commandments that we've done so far. So thank you, Debbie, just for that. Uh, but yeah, we've, uh, we've been reflecting on a different commandment each week and recognizing the fact that they are all still relevant for today. We've been looking into how we respond to these godly guidelines in today's culture and also in our everyday lives. So this week, uh, we're going to be looking at this commandment, you shall not give false witness against your neighbor. Or as J. John says, and we've been connecting it with J. John's uh, just interpretation of the commandments, uh, how to hold to the truth. And it's hard, isn't it, in today's society to hold on to truth. Uh, And we're going to look at what does it mean to not give false witness against our neighbor. You should not give false witness against your neighbor. It's found in Exodus 20, verse 16. And in other words, it basically means don't tell lies, especially about others. This commandment and advice is quite straightforward, challenging, but straightforward. And as always, the subject I'm speaking on is something I am also needing to work on. So none of us can say we're the full package and have got all of this sorted or locked down. We're all works in progress, uh, me included. So today's talk will be short and sweet, a bit like myself. But it's basically, don't lie. So we can go home now and I can get to the villa. No, I can't. Um, But I'm going to start by lying to you, so I hope that's all right. So I'm going to give you three statements, and uh, two of these are true, one is a lie, okay? And you've got to decide which one you think is the lie. So the three statements are, I have done two parachute jumps. Statement two, I've been banned from a pub. Statement three, (laughs) why does everybody go, yeah, for that one? (laughs) Statement three, I've never been to America. Okay, so three statements. So, first of all, who thinks number one is false? Oh, okay. oh we've got one hand. Pat's at the back. So, who thinks statement two is false? Okay. How, I've got a bad reputation here, haven't I? <laughs> oh, well. Who thinks statement three is false? And there's some people who ain't voted here. So, some, there's a few people. Oh, Mark's again. Yeah. Okay, well, I shall tell you that I have done two parachute jumps, um, one at 10,000 feet, but the first one I did was 7,500 feet, which was on my own um, uh, in Langer, Nottingham, and the second was the tandem uh, at 10,000 feet. Both amazing. If you just do it, it's, it's one of the most exhilarating things I've ever done in my life. Can I just confess something? I did swear when I came out of the plane. <laughs> I'm just confessing the right there. <laughs> Um, but it was an amazing experience. Okay, and I'd, sadly, I need to say that I've also have been banned from a pub. Um, I will give a bit of an... I was only young, and um, I used to work in a music shop uh, selling guitars when I left school. And uh, it was a dodgy part of... Bottom of Old Snow Hill, those that know it, and there was a pub there that had a function room. And the bosses weren't, weren't the most generous of people at times, but they said, well, hire the upstairs room, We'll put on a, a buffet for all the lads and um, lots of trifle and lots of everything. Anyway, ended up having a big food fight um, and trifle went everywhere and it was so bad that they had to close the function room to get it redecorated and we were all banned from that pub. So there you go. So yes, I have been to America, not as many as times as some people, but I have been. And uh, so statement three was the lie, was the porky pie. Okay. Anyway, going back to uh, the commandment, you shall not give false witness against your neighbor. We often lie to cover up who we really are or to make ourselves look better. Sometimes we exaggerate the truth to make us or a situation look better than it really is. Every exaggeration of the truth, once detected by others, destroys our credibility and makes all that we do and say suspicious. 
we can exaggerate the truth for a positive way or a negative way. So it's a bit like Ron. We've got Ron here. Where's Ron? Here he is. So it's a bit like Ron coming back from fishing and saying, I caught this fish. It was this big. We can exaggerate, can't we? But I bet Ron has caught some big fish, to be fair. We can also exaggerate stories about ourselves or others to make the situation worse than it really is. And uh, you've heard of this phrase, how, you know, we make a mountain out of a molehill. And what does that mean? A lot of people are guilty of making mountains out of molehills, and they do that by adding more dirt. You know, we elaborate on something and we exaggerate to make something worse than it really is or better than it really is. We can be guilty of both, can't we? A lot of people are guilty of making mountains out of molehills and they do that by adding dirt. We need to be careful that we don't elaborate on stories we've heard or elaborate on the truth. Often, we don't face the truth of who we are and what we've done simply because we don't want to take responsibility for it. We make it somebody else's fault. We try and shift responsibility to family, friends, work, or the situation we currently find ourselves in. And this universal temptation to evade responsibility goes way back. As far as Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, then blamed each other and the serpent, and then God confronted them. In some ways, neither Adam or Eve were lying, but neither were they telling the truth. They certainly didn't admit to their fault and their guilt. And so it all starts, the great human trait of trying to duck responsibility. Blame it on somebody else, something else, anybody but me. The Bible repeatedly compares truth and falsehood with light and darkness. To face the truth is like moving from darkness into light. And it can be quite liberating, leaving the burden of living with lies behind and walking into the light. Facing up to the truth means accepting responsibility for our guilt and our fallibility. It means admitting the things that we do wrong are wrong. It means that we must avoid putting the defense of ourselves above everything else. Telling the truth is costly, uncomfortable, and it goes against our deepest nature at times. Sometimes we end up being asked to lie to help somebody else out. And this can get us into a right mess. And I'm, I'm sure some of you will be aware of this character. 1940s Walt Disney film Pinocchio. When we learn about a wooden puppet whose nose grows every time he tells a lie. It's a punishment. And depending on how big the lie depends on how long his nose grows. It's a good job that doesn't happen to each one of us. Well, I know some of us will be tripping over each other's noses. You'll be tripping over mine anyway. But we're going to see a short clip from Shrek 2, which was released in 2004, where we'll see that Shrek donkey and Puss in Boots. It's a biblical story, as you can tell. Um, they've, they've all been captured, and they need Pinocchio's help. Get us out of here! Like you most certainly am all. Oh. I am not. What kind? It's a thong! Ow! Their briefs! Hold on! R2! R2! Alright, here we go. Hang tight. Ugh. Wait, wait, wait. Ow, ow. Hey, hey, hey! I did giggle every time I saw that. That's uh, very funny. But you know, lying to help somebody else out can get us into a right mess. Even if it helps them out, it could sometimes get us in a right mess. So back to the commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So to bear false witness means to tell something which is not true. However, this ninth commandment is quite specific, that it's not just about lying, but it is also telling us we shouldn't lie about other people. 
Our use and abuse of truth affects our relationship with others. Lies are not just wrong, they can also hurt people. So who is our neighbour? When we read this commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. Well, in Luke 10, verse 29, a certain lawyer asked Jesus that very question. And in response, Jesus relates the story of the Good Samaritan. In this story, Jesus makes it very clear that our neighbour is anyone who encounter, we encounter that need our help. Since everyone needs help of some kind, that means that ultimately everyone we come into contact with is our neighbour. Some obviously are closer neighbours than others, but all of those we encounter in our day-to-day lives are our neighbours. The Ninth Commandment reminds us that our words can be very dangerous, and in today's society, we treat words far too lightly. We need to be truthful in what we say for the health of our society, for our relationships and for ourselves. We need to have a reputation as Christians for being trustworthy men and women whose words are both honest and fair. It's so important in this world we live in. This commandment is broken over and over again. It's broken in a variety of ways and the effects can be incredibly damaging. This commandment is frequently broken in courts of law, sometimes with deadly results. Justice should be based upon truth. If someone lies on the witness stand, they may rob another person of their property, their time, their reputation or even their life. And it is scary to realise how widely this commandment is broken in today's courts. Some years ago, a judge of the New York Supreme Court declared, we have reached the point where we merely try to find out which side is lying most. That's a scary thought, isn't it? The most horrendous horrendous example of this kind of lying that ever occurred is recorded in Matthew 26. In that chapter we read that two false witnesses testified against Jesus. The one perfect person who ever walked the earth. And as a result of their deceitful witness, Jesus, the Son of God, was condemned to death. But bearing false witness against our neighbour isn't just confined to courts of law. It also happens in everyday life. Whether we realise it or not, we are always bearing witness, either for or against our neighbour. And it's easy to slip into the sin of bearing false witness. One way to bear false witness against our neighbour is to obviously tell a flat out lie about someone. And this grieves God. It's simply an obvious or blatant lie. No substance of the truth. But false witness may also take forms other than direct lying. And found this uh, Jewish Yiddish proverb, a half truth is a whole lie. It's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge. We often say, well, it's kind of half true. What does that mean? It's half true. It's either true or false, isn't it? But we can all use it, justify it. We can slander by relating information which is technically correct, but relating it as to create a false impression. For instance, a sailor who was responsible for making daily entries in the ship's log got angry at the first mate. So that night he wrote in the ship's log, the first mate was sober today. We all know those kind of underlying kind of words that are said. We can also bear false witness by silence. And you might think, how on earth can we bear false witness by silence? When we hear somebody being falsely accused of something and we fail to speak up and defend that person's reputation, our silence amounts to giving consent. An American journalist said this, which is a really powerful statement. Silence is a lie. Silence has a loud voice. It shouts, nothing important is happening, don't worry. So when something important is going on, silence is a lie. And we think about the injustice in our world and we can just sit back and not let nothing happen. Or we can stand up and speak. Sometimes our silence is just as much a lie as as us maybe saying something false against someone. I suppose the biggest one when we talk about um, bearing false witness against our neighbours is, uh, is gossip. And apologies for the two female. I'm not saying that it's only women who gossip because blokes do as well, so don't worry. But um, I did find these amusing. We rationalise things, don't we? I don't refer to it as gossiping. I prefer sharing our opinions about other people's life choices. <laughs> it's a good way of uh, saying it, isn't it? 
I only work here for the coffee donuts and hot office gossip. And I love this line. A gossiper is someone with a great sense of rumour. It's true, isn't it? But, you know, um, as I say, men do gossip. And uh, I don't know whether you've got one of these groups that you're a part of. We're part of this, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit kind of gutted I've joined it now. But it's a WhatsApp group, and it's not one of the church ones, don't worry. Um, but it's a WhatsApp group for our locality, and it's a bit like a neighborhood watch. And um, so people put silly things on. Like We had this thing on the other day where everyone's got ring doorbells. And all you see from different angles is this man walked down the road at one o'clock. And people are... Pa- anyway, this distant story is not about that. But um, so anyway, we've got, we're a part of this WhatsApp group for our road and adjacent roads. Like I said, a neighborhood watch. And uh, we've just got this, they just got this started. And I thought, I'll join. It's a good thing to join. And um, one of the first comments that was put on was this. This guy says, these are his words. There is an Asian man at the bottom of the road in his car speaking very loudly. I think he's selling drugs. So that was the first statement. And then the person then decided to put the car number plate into the WhatsApp group. So the uh, number plate went in. Now, what was kind of amusing was when reading it back saying, I recognise that number plate. And it happened to be Joe, my son's girlfriend's car. <laughs> now, my, my son's girlfriend is not Asian, uh, not male, and wasn't speaking loudly in a car and definitely isn't selling drugs. Not that we know of. And, um, but what they'd actually done was there was a similar car around the corner, similar type of car, and they assumed it was the same car, so I put the number plate in. But can you imagine, this is the danger that can happen when we... When we get information wrong and then we share it to loads of people, it's not great, is it? Um, So we need to be very careful about what information we pass on to others. It is true. Sorry, even if it's true, are we certain it's accurate? Is it helpful? And even if we know it to be factual, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right for us to pass it on. Some things are better left unsaid, even if they're true. It's getting the balance right, isn't it? But one of the biggest problems with gossip is that so often the information is not true. Falsehood seems to travel faster than truth. Gossip travels faster than truth a lot of the time. And we, a great quote from um, Mark Twain, which I think is so true. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. It's true, isn't it? Gossip, lies travel quicker so often than truth. And we see that in the media, we see it in press, we see it in our own lives so often. There's a story of a gossiper that uh, felt convicted when he learnt that the man he had lied about for so long was dying. This liar went to the dying man he had slandered and asked him forgiveness. The victim said, I do forgive you, but I want you to do something. I'd like you to cut open this feather pillow, go to the window, because they were on the upper story, and dump all of those feathers out of the window. The man was puzzled, but did so. When he'd finished, his victim said, Now I'd like you to go and gather up all of those feathers. The man replied, Why, that's impossible. The wind has blown those feathers everywhere. There's no way I could ever retrieve all of them. The dying man said, You're right. And it's impossible to undo the hurt you've done to me with your gossip, but I do forgive you. But my reputation has been irreparably damaged. So true, isn't it? Words that we speak can make a lasting effect on someone's life without us even realising it at times. There's so many scriptures throughout the Bible that talk about this and this one. The tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. It's true. Very true. So often the words that we say, I'm sure you've done it. I often speak before thinking and uh, I'll say stuff and then think, oh, I wish I hadn't have said that. I wish I could pull it back in. And the danger is, isn't it? It's gone. It can get out there. Rumours can spread so quickly and easily, as we've just mentioned. As I mentioned, lots of scriptures. Colossians 3 verse 9. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Many in Proverbs. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. In other words... So often, the words of a gospel, we, we internalize, we take them in. They, they affect us 
can be toxic. Proverbs 6 verse 19. God's very strong here. God hates a false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. That's so relevant. If you're another thing which isn't great, Facebook groups. So we're part of the Albury one, the Smethic one, the Rarely Regis one. And I sometimes look at them and dear me, the rumours that get spread out on social media around people and individuals is, is so damaging at times. To hold on to the truth, to not bear false witness against one another. If we're going to do this, we need to think before we speak. There's a, a church uh, leader who's, who's been around for a, a quite a number of years now. And as you know, I do a lot with trying to connect church leaders together across the area. And um, I remember when this church leader first came, there was lots of words, rumours, things said. And, um, and I went to meet and have a coffee. I'm going back a long time ago. And just to hear his heart and to hear what his plans were. Realising that a lot of the things that had been said weren't necessarily true. And I made a commitment to him at that point and said, if I ever hear anything... I will never take it on board until I've come to speak to you. And wanted to make sure that out of relationship, that's the way we worked. And I said also publicly, I'll never say anything bad about your ministry, about what you do, because I believe God's using you. And you know, we need to be people that are honourable, don't we? Stand up when things are bad and say when we recognise, but also think before we speak. Instead of sending a message out of something that might be a half-truth, might be a complete lie because we've never done the digging to find out what's behind the words that have been said. Paul's advice to the church in Philippi is worth holding on to today as we look at this commandment. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honourable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And that's uh, in Philippians. And, uh, just to close today, I want us to think, as it says... Think before we speak. This week, today, before you send an email, before you put anything on social media, this is a good little guideline that uh, falls in line with that scripture from Philippians. Before you think, is it true? And how do you know that? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Because sometimes it's not. Is it kind? And I can imagine if we, if we lived our lives in that way, some of the messages, some of the things that are portrayed would, would not be there because of us thinking before speaking. And So this week, we all struggle with this. We all struggle with getting pulled into all kinds of conversations at work, at home, in church. You know, let's be people that think before we speak. Let's pray. God, we want to thank you today that you're a God of grace and you, you understand, as Mary shared during communion, Lord, that we're... We mess up, we do, because of the world we live in, because of our human nature. But we thank you, God, that you love us today. You care about us and you want us to go again this week to try and live good and godly lives. Help us, Father, today with the words that we speak, with the information that we share, whether it be in, uh, by word, by email, via text, social media. Lord, help us to, to think before we speak before we type Lord we want to be godly men and women that the world looks at and sees us and values us for our integrity will you help us Lord this week to be people that live out the gospel message and show the love of God to those that we meet Amen <laughs>